1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. for April 16th, 2010. We are Benjamin and Carrie Higginbotham's, Higginbotham's your host for this evening. If you're not watching live, you absolutely should. We do the show every Friday at 2 o'clock a.m. coordinated universal time. And uh, as the chat room so uh, aptly pointed out, Space Vidcast has had two RTLSs tonight. <laughs> we, have been, uh, we have been enjoying the chat room. Uh, all evening and you know we do listen to the community and there was a lot of stuff going on in news today so I think we're gonna bring up back an old friend here you go Space news. In that chat room oh it's just gonna be one of those nights uh, you know Obama had his speech earlier today at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I had to think of which one was which, and there was a, a lot that he covered. There was the fiscal year 2011 stuff uh, that he had we had covered many, many times, covered to death in the past. Basically, the uh, cancellation of Constellation. That is hard to say. Uh, and then uh, moving pretty much purely to an entirely private space segment, and, and a lot of people in the old space communities were infuriated by this. Now, new space was kind of like, you know, yay, that's awesome, but, you know, a lot of people were like, this doesn't make sense. There's no actual vision here. There's no destination. There's no timeline. Well, President Obama went down, and he gave us a little bit of a revised insight into fiscal year 2011, I think. Uh, the first thing that was revised is Orion made a surprise reappearance. I did not, well, actually, I was kind of hoping Orion would make it back. Orion it was, I think, a good a good part of the Constellation program. And uh, here's what Obama had to say about Orion. In addition, as part of this effort, we will build on the good work already done on the Orion, or Orion crew capsule. I've directed Charlie Bolden to immediately begin developing a rescue vehicle using this technology so we are not forced to rely on foreign providers if it becomes necessary to quickly bring our people home from the Internet. And this Orion effort will be part of the technological foundation for advanced spacecraft to be used in future deep space missions. In fact, Orion will be readied for flight right here in this room. Emergency crew vehicle. Did you catch that part? Mm -hmm. That's the interesting part, and the chat room certainly caught that as well. And that's the interesting thing, is that we're going to continue development of Orion, but just as an evac system for ISS. That's kind of what I got out of that. But then he talked about as a future platform for deep space exploration. But, yeah, I mean, and as Jason pointed out in the chat room, weak applause. You could kind of hear it. It was kind of a golf applause. It was a yay. And in other parts of the video, there's certainly loud applause. Hey, Jason, was there people, like, holding up signs that said applause just <laughs> out of curiosity? Because that's kind of how it felt to me, that, you know, people were applauding, but they kind of didn't know why, mm. almost like they were told to. I don't know. It, well, part, I mean, it might be because they were like, what, what do you mean as an evac system? You know, maybe yeah. it's a good thing, right? Maybe this is, you know, injecting some life into Orion. And Orion, I don't, in my opinion, was not necessarily a bad thing. So it was, it was kind of nice to see it make a comeback. I just wish it would have made a bigger comeback than what we saw. Mm -hmm. But we, we'll see, right? I mean, we'll see where it really goes. 
Uh, in addition to Orion, uh, we, we know that Ares-1 has essentially been canceled. And, you, you know, everyone knows Space Vidcast's opinion on that. Uh, Ares-1, in, in my personal opinion, was kind of a bad idea. Sticking humans on top of a solid rocket booster just from the beginning, it, it's not safe. It's uh, scary. It is. It's scary, right? Uh, Ares-5, I always thought, was actually kind of a good idea, though. It, you need a really big, heavy lifter, something that's Saturn V equivalent, you mm -hmm. know, something that can bring that much stuff to the moon, Mars, and beyond. You need a big big vehicle to get out of space. Um, but they canceled Ares 5 as well. Well, Obama talked about prospects for a new rocket. Next, we will invest more than three billion dollars to conduct research on an advanced heavy lift rocket, a vehicle to efficiently send into orbit the crew capsules, propulsion systems, and large quantities of supplies needed to reach deep space. And developing this new vehicle, we will not only look at revising or modifying older models, we want to look at new designs, new materials, new technologies that will transform not just where we can go, but what we can do when we get there. And we will finalize a rocket design no later than 2015 and then begin to build it. Now, as, as BZ pointed out in the chat room, mm -hmm. um, you know what Obama's also talking about uh, alternate propulsion me methods right. and that was talked about also in the speech but he's talking about an actual new rocket a new heavy lift rocket at that point to be designed by 2015 and then built after that right. so I don't think the timeline comparison he gave against the Ares rockets is really fair now um, I assume this would be more equivalent to an Ares 5 than an Ares 1. I don't know. I'm making some assumptions here. Right. But it would be designed by 2015. Right. So building wouldn't even begin until then. And we've already designed the Ares 1 and been building it for a while. And, you know, look at how long that's been taking. So I don't know how long that's going to take to actually get out the door. Um, you know, we'll see what comes to pass on that one. He's, he's looking for uh, a next-gen vehicle using innovative technologies, not just going back to the... Uh, Apollo system. Uh, oh, BZ is mentioning that we always need new propulsion. Yeah, and actually, you know, I'm going to, I'll touch on that for just a second. Uh, tonight's guest, uh, John Powell, and we're going to get to him in a, in a few moments, uh, we're going to be talking exactly about that, alternate methods of propulsion into space. And as many of you know, we're huge advocates of alternate propulsion here in Space Vidcast because what we have today uh, just doesn't work as well, right? And they're bringing up Alice in the chat room, uh, aluminum ice, uh, uh, you know, the, the systems we have today, we, we developed in the, you know, 50s, 60s, and we just stick lots of it on a rocket. Almost, almost our, our rockets are almost completely fuel. That's, mm -hmm. And then you got this teeny tiny capsule up top. We need better propulsion. We need cheaper ways to get up into space. So anyhow, that's, uh, I'll get off that soapbox. But what's interesting is it's a completely new rocket from what I, from what I understand, which means, uh, are we talking about the, are we talking Jupiter 241 stretched heavy? I mean, what kind of rocket are we talking about here? And uh, why are we designing yet another rocket? Yeah. What's wrong with Ares 5? Really, I mean, as much as people really don't, a lot of people, new spacers, don't like the Constellation program, but take a step back for a moment. Really, what's wrong with Ares 5? It, it used the solid rocket boosters on the side, much like anything else. It used a chemical rocket in the middle. It, 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 you know, it, it seemed like a decent design. It was just a big, big rocket. It seemed like a, a decent design. So. I'm a little surprised that we're going back to the drawing board on that, but there were some really good alternate rockets out there, mm -hmm. like the Jupiter 241 stretch heavy and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see what NASA comes up with there. And of course, one thing that we all complained about, I don't think anyone really liked uh, this particular aspect of the old fiscal year 2011 plan, was there was no timeline, there were no destinations, there was nothing. It was just, we're going to go, we're going to go to commercial space. Uh, but now, he's actually proposed some rough timelines. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And by 2025, we expect new spacecraft designed for long journeys to allow us to begin the first ever crewed missions beyond the moon into deep space. So we'll start. We'll start by sending astronauts to an asteroid for the first time in history. Yeah. 
By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And a landing on Mars will follow. And I expect to be around to see it. And uh, as the chat room pointed out, 2025, these are really long timelines he's talking about. And uh, as Obama himself pointed out, political, t uh, p political tides change NASA's funding structure yeah. and what they're doing. I mean, here's a perfect example of it, right? I mean, NASA was on a course, and now we've got a new president. We're changing course. Right. What happens when Obama's no longer president? He's talking about timelines outside of his presidency. He cannot, mm -hmm. he cannot be president during these timelines. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see what actually happens in the long run. And there are some great article, articles on the Space Tweep Society and I think on NASA Watch as well. I'm pretty sure it's actually on NASA Watch. Uh, someone in the chat room, correct me if I'm wrong, called uh, something along the lines of, do we have um, uh, a national space program or presidential space program? And it's a, r a really good read to see what's going on there and, and develop your own opinion on what's going to happen here. Um, I would argue that the timelines we need to set forth, much like what JFK did, need to be in decade increments at maximum. Mm -hmm. So when we say we're going to go to a near-Earth object, we have 10 years to accomplish that. Anything beyond that, the American people lose interest. They just can't, you can't think that far out. You can't plan that far out. It's just too difficult. Mm -hmm. So we need to do these in decade. And I'm, I'm glad that we've got a vision to 2025 and on, but... You know, yeah, and Jason, exactly, a decade to at milestones. At most, at most. Yep, right. So, you know, a decade to major milestones. It took right. us nine years to go from having ne absolutely no idea how to put humans on the moon to putting humans on the moon. Mm -hmm. Nine years to do mm -hmm. it. It can be done. It's difficult to do, and it takes a lot of money. But you, you, this is, there's a time span that you have to work with, in my opinion. There's a time span you have to work with, and I just don't think that this is short enough. I think it's too long, and people are going to lose interest too quickly. And because we've got this presidential uh, space program, it, it, no, by no fault of NASA or the president, that's just how it's set up. Uh, because of that, the tides can shift away, and you know who knows what's going to happen when the next president comes on board. And that hinders everyone, right? I mean, the innovation, anyhow, there's that. And uh, finally, uh, he did talk about the moon, and the chat room brought this up as well. Um, the, a lot of people, myself included, were a little bit disappointed that he talked about going to near-Earth objects, or he called them asteroids, but near-Earth objects first, and then to Mars next, and kind of bypass the moon. Here's what he had to say about the moon. I understand that some believe that we should attempt a return to the surface of the moon first, as previously planned. But I, I just have to say, uh, pretty bluntly here, we've been there before. Buzz has been there. There's a lot more of space to explore and a lot more to learn when we do. So I believe it's more important to ramp up our capabilities to reach and operate at a series of increasingly demanding targets while advancing our technological capabilities with each step forward. And that's what this strategy does. And that's how we will ensure that our leadership in space is even stronger in this new century than it was in the last. Yeah, so uh, as the chat room pointed out again, point to the chat room, very little applause. It was definitely a, a like, really, no moon? What's going on there? However, I will say, and while I don't think I agree with it, it is a compelling argument. We have been there. The solar system is a very large place. We don't have to go back to the moon. Mm -hmm. The moon is large and it's an interesting goal, but so is Mars and so are near-Earth objects. And uh, Jason was there. He actually was there in the crowd. We have pictures yeah. of him in the crowd. And, and you can hear it even in the reel. The applause just died. I'm not sure how many people agree with the statement of not going to the moon. Right. Certainly Buzz thinks that. Buzz Aldrin thinks that. He has I, said that many I, times. Yeah, absolutely. Been there, done that. And you know, I have a great deal of respect for Buzz Aldrin. Uh, and another one is uh, Dr. Uh, Zubrin also is like, mm -hmm. skip the moon. There, we've been there, done that. Go to Mars. Do the scientific studies on Mars. Go straight on. Um, you know, again, I'm not sure I... I'm more of a moon first, Mars second guy, but you know what, right. above all, I'm a let's go get out and explore and do innovative well, let's things. Let's do something. And so if, if that means going to the, a near-Earth object in Mars before going back to the moon, then by all means, I will, I will get in line and chant that with, with the president and with NASA. If that means going back to the moon first, then you know what, we go back to the moon first. But uh, we, we need to do something. Low Earth orbit is for, what has it been, 40 years, 30 years? It's, it's just too long. It's, it's time... <sighs> Time for us to move on and actually explore the cosmos in which we live. Uh, so though, you can watch the entire NASA 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, President Obama uh, presentation uh, on the Space Vcast YouTube channel. It'll be uploaded shortly. Epic subscribers, you can download the raw MPEG-2 file uh, that existed uh, directly off the NASA satellite. In case you want it, you'll be able to do that uh, again, uh, t well, it'll be Friday. You'll be able to do that Friday. Uh, and then also for Epic subscribers taking a step backwards, you can do that also for the STS-131 launch that is now available. Uh, and you can also do that for uh, a bunch of the media files mm -hmm. that, that are available only to Epic subscribers. And Epic is what helps Spacific Cast do what we're doing. Um, I'd like to bring our guest on here in a second. But before we do that, just a quick reminder, you'll see this Twitter box right down here. Right there. If you tweet out on Space Vidcast, and I got my cool little iPad showing me all the Space Vidcast tweets. Not that you can see it, but it's there. Um, if you tweet out on Space Vidcast, uh, you are automatically entered uh, just Space Vidcast something. At Space Vidcast, hash Space Vidcast, something Space Vidcast. You're automatically entered into a contest to win Floating to Space. You want to do a quick guest intro for me? Oh, uh, sure. Um... For the past 28 years, uh, John Powell, John M. Powell, uh, has been the president of JP Aerospace, not the Japanese aerospace, but JP, <laughs> his initials, aerospace, Clever. Um, also known as America's other space program. He and his team at JPA have flown nearly 100 missions from rockets to airships. He has uh, two patents pending for airships related uh, related work and has designed, built, and tested one of the very few propellers that function at 100,000 feet. He's built and flown uh, sounding rockets for the U.S. Air Force and the state of Texas. And many of JP's innovative flights have been reported in Popular Mechanics, Space News, and CNN, amongst others. An ABC News series on JP Aerospace was the winner of a Television Emmy Award. JP is recognized as an expert in low-cost rocket and airship design and flight, and is frequently asked to participate in government reviews and expert panels. Uh, he started Pong Set, like ping pongs. Awesome. Uh, which is a student flight program, now having flown over 3,000 experiments to 100,000 feet involving more than 8,000 students at no cost, of course, to the schools or students. So we welcome JP, or John Powell, to Space Fitcast. And, uh, you know, as, as we mentioned in pre-show, John, we're huge advocates for alternate propulsion methods of getting into space because what we've got now is basically a controlled explosion that you're sitting on top of. And you've got some interesting ideas on how to get humans into low Earth orbit without needing to do that controlled explosion. Uh, can you touch on really quickly what your plan is to do that? Well, basically, the idea is if you take a big balloon and you float it at the top of the atmosphere, and you know everyone thinks of balloons at 90 to 100,000 feet, but now balloons are pushing much higher altitudes. The Japanese have been to 175,000 feet. And we have a vehicle we think we can reach 200,000 feet by balloon. And say you put your balloon up there. Well, now you have a balloon that's just floating at 100,000 feet. And then what if you put a propulsion system on there? Not some fast-burning rocket, but some really slow-burning electric-style propulsion system. Well, now you have a balloon you can kind of push around. Not very interesting at 200,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But then what if you gave it a wing shape? And when you push it forward, it goes up a little bit. And as the drag decreases, you go up further and further, go faster and faster. The question is, how far can you drive that model? Can you drive it all the way to orbit? And the Cape Aerospace is basically doing that experiment. And we're now 31 years into the project, and we just flew our 100th um, last year. Another experiment um, just to see if this actually will work. So. You, you talk about going into uh, low Earth orbit using the balloons, but what kind of payload can you deliver using this technology? Can you deliver just really small payloads, or can you deliver larger, m more meaty payloads, as it were? Actually, the, the technology, as we envision it, scales really well. In fact, it doesn't work very well on the small size. We envision the standard vehicle. In fact, the model that we're working on is 60,000 pounds to LEO. Wow. wow. <laughs> but and now in your book, wait, hang on, hang on, I've got a, a good little thing. In your book, Floating to Space, there you go, nice little lad, uh, available through apogeebooks.com. Uh, in your book, you, you talk about a three-stage system. Uh, can you touch on what each stage is into LEO really quickly? Yeah, because one of the problems we discovered early on is that the airship has to be so big to climb, you know, at 280 to 300,000 feet. Um, you're talking about a vehicle that's literally over a mile long, and it's a gossamer structure. 
um, just very thin film membranes going at very high velocities. And this airship actually can't exist in the lower atmosphere. The turbulence, the pressures, the things would just tear it up. You build an airship that's strong enough um, to survive through the lower atmosphere, and it's way too heavy um, to even come close to making an orbital attempt. So you end up with this low-altitude airship that goes from the ground to 140,000 feet, and then an orbital airship that goes from 140,000 feet, slowly spiraling, accelerating over time to orbit. And what ties them together is basically a floating space station, but instead of in orbit, it's sitting right at the top of the atmosphere at 140,000 feet, a buoyant floating vehicle, and that's the transition stage. So it ends up being a three-stage system, an airship from the ground to 140,000 feet, going to what we call the dark sky station, and that's the, a permanent facility at 100,000 feet. Basically, that's our space station. You know, we don't put space stations in can, uh, seaports in Kansas. We put them at the edge of the sea. This is going to be our spaceport at the edge of space. And then from there, the larger airship goes from the 140,000 feet into orbit. You know, I think the big difference is putting a seaport at, at you know, the, the edge of the sea. The land doesn't really move, right? I mean, the land is stuck to the Earth. Yes. Whereas, uh, you know, putting a space station up there, you're, you're traveling at a pretty fast velocity at that point. How do you, are you going to keep the, find a way to keep the spaceport stationary, or do you just kind of let the Earth rotate around it, and then you launch when it makes sense? How, how does... Oh, there's, there's two places that you can put the, we call it the dark sky station. Um, We've flown four of them so far in, you know, still very, very small sizes. The largest one we flew was 70 feet across. Um, you can either put it orbiting the equator, and about once a month it makes an rota entire rotation around the Earth, hmm. or you could put it at the poles in the Arctic or the Antarctic vortex, and then it will simply circle the pole. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to be doing it, using it for... Uh, Equatorial launches, you'll want the one that essentially slowly orbits the Earth. You allow it to drift around the Earth uh, rather than try to hold it over a particular place. Right. Space Cadet actually asks a really good question, which is, can the station be used to support communications equipment uh, or atmospheric monitors as well, or are the margins for that too small? Can you really only use it to do payload transfer from um, the Earth-bound balloon and then to the station and then from the station to the, uh, uh, the uh, LEO balloon? That, that's actually an excellent question because that comes to how we're paying for all of this. Um, you know, we're not, we don't get government grants, we don't get tax dollars. Every part of our system has to pay for itself standalone for this to work. In fact, the development project can't be a big hole in the ground that you put money, like most development projects, the development system. And we've discovered that the is, is very interested in using the station. In fact, we've already done some flights and some tests for them. Um, as an alternative flight, well, it's essentially a high altitude relay point. So that, that actually is one of the early, early uses of a small station, or they're even used as a transfer station, is for telecom. In fact, oh. we call that a Pier 6 station, uh, it's basically funded through the. Uh, hmm. uh, talk about the, the second part of this leap. So we go from Earth to the station, and now. From the station, we can get up into low Earth orbit. Um, what's that second part? Because that's you, you talk about the, uh, that being a much larger wingspan. Um, why do you need a much larger wingspan? And then where can you go with this larger, larger object? Um, basically, it's a hybrid vehicle. It's part airship, part airplane, part rocket. <laughs> um, at the very beginning, when it pulls away from the station at 130, excuse me, 140,000 feet, it's primarily an airship. Um, and it gets its climb primarily through buoyancy. And around 180,000 feet, it's losing most of its buoyancy. It can't really climb higher than that. And that's when it's transitioning as a flying wing, in a sense, into an aircraft, using the acceleration from the engines uh, to provide climb. As you get higher and higher, um, that's less and less effective. And when you get to approximately 340,000 feet, that's when the engines will be throttling up for a more traditional insertion. And, and how, so it's just a large, how effective is all of this, though? Is this real? Can you actually do it? Well, like I said, this has been um, 
we knew it was a lifetime project going in. We're now at two years on the project and 104 um, test flights so far. And our estimates have test flights to go to put this off. And when we started, it was about a dozen completely impossible things. Simply and we uh -oh. uh oh i'm gonna pause you for a second i think we're about to lose you we've lost your audio for just a moment i'll have okay. you just hold on for one second um calf do you know if it's stabilized at all <laughs> he doesn't know all right uh a large echo uh you do have an echo i was hearing a large echo not now all right but a moment ago yeah, so let's go. Uh, no, I'm sorry. So uh, keep going. We'll, we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to hang on. Usually, when we have this, we're about to lose our guest off of Skype. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, keep going. Well, let's say there were many completely impossible things, and we keep lining them off one at a time. Now, a lot of folks will say, well, there's still these three or four impossible things. Well, you know, I'm not really worried about that. We know about them. Those are just the next big things to tackle. It's like the one of the biggest ones is really on the first stage airship. We needed a propeller mm -hmm. that worked at 100,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Now, the Air Force had spent about 20 years working on this propeller and over $10 billion and declared that it could not be done. Wait, million uh, or billion? Billion, the big B word, over <laughs> two decades. Wow. Um, and simply declared that it, it could not happen, and they showed very clearly all the reasons why <laughs> it would not work. Yeah. Um, and then a NASA program, at basically the same time we were attempting to develop the propeller, and they came up with a propeller that was successful. We came up with a propeller that was successful. They used theirs on the Helios. It's a high altitude flying wing mm -hmm. that made it to 90,000 feet. And we developed a propeller and we put it on some of our airship vehicles and tested it at altitude. And so these are now the, the two only propellers in the world that work at 100,000 feet. And NASA spent a few million dollars on theirs and we spent about 5,000 on ours. Um, Wow. And ours outperforms theirs just by a little bit. But that was one of those things that could be absolutely proven it doesn't work. And we just did it in a slightly different way. In fact, we got the, this is a propeller here. I don't know if you can see it in there. It's a big carbon and yeah. Kevlar feeder blade. And we know it works as we actually hauled it up there and spun it and measured the performance of the propeller. Uh, but there is some huge challenges still to go. Uh, it's like the active drag reduction systems. We've already flown several anti-drag reduction um, test flights, but there's still a lot of test flights to go to make that work. Um, I can't tell you that 100% it's going to work, but I can't tell you that we're giving it a heck of a try, and we will absolutely know. <laughs> well, it's worth pointing out. I mean, you've flown that, right? I mean, that's been up there, and you've actually used that, that's it. That's been up there. We actually flown it, spun it, spun it around. Um, and quite a few of the things that have been completely impossible, we've basically ruled them out by actually, you know, failing quite a bit. We actually fail probably more than any other space program, um, but we just keep at it and keep at it. And, you know, it's going to be many, many years to go, but we found even a business model that actually supports the development. Our development doesn't cost us money, it makes us money. If we actually are running shy on funds, we go out and, and work harder, build and fly more. Um, and keep the program going. You, you know, tonight's news was uh, with Obama was mostly human sp spaceflight related. Um, what about using this for human spaceflight? Is that something that can be done in the future, or is that just the payloads are too oh. precious and too heavy? This is specifically designed for human spaceflight. We think the whole way of going to space right now is just wrong. It's like if you had a big cargo ship and you had it in Liverpool and you needed to go to New York. Engineering tells us the most efficient way is to put giant piles of dynamite under, dynamite under it, light it on fire, burn all that energy as rapidly as possible, because that's the most efficient. You can't beat it. You just can't. And you hurl that cargo ship or even maybe the, uh, um, an ocean liner with tourists on board to New York. And in five minutes, suddenly it's flinging over there and someone's got to catch it in New York Harbor, which is one of the other problems. Um, but that, that's the way we go to space right now. You know, if you put some low-burning diesel engine and you deal with all the drag of the ship and you plot across for 20 days across the Atlantic, if you work out the numbers, that is hugely inefficient. It's the way I would rather travel. And we think that's the way we should be traveling. Um, instead of the high speed road. I think it from five to eight. 
in the orbit in our system. But say halfway up, you can fail. Instead of, you know, the loss of who everybody died, you have to stop and you have a meeting. You're floating there. You don't kick the engines, you tear them apart, you rebuild them, and if you can't get it going, well, you come back down to the station, you get a point again, we'll continue on your way. It changes the whole nature from this really dangerous thing to you know, safe aircraft. crap. All right, so just to recap, because you did break up a little bit again, uh, the wonders of uh, uh, bleeding edge technology. Uh, but, you know, it, it's safer simply because you're not strapping dynamite to your back. And, and actually, you have a great chapter in your book. It's, it's actually in the very beginning. Uh, I, I, I apologize for pronouncing this wrong. It's like the Wan Hu method. Um, Correct. Uh, and, and talking about uh, an early stories of uh, rocket travel in China, where basically uh, he, he has a, a couple of kites, a bunch of rockets on his back, has a bunch of people run up with uh, torches to light his rockets, and then he's never really heard. You don't really hear anything after that, so uh, one and assumes he's never that's heard from again. ambiguous. No, no. They don't say whether he really did go to space, or he just said he was no longer there <laughs> <laughs> after the big fireball went away. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and, and you mention, and you, you draw a parallel to our current rockets, and say, you know, we haven't changed much since that era and what we do today. We've basically just learned how to control the explosion. Uh, whereas with your method, rather than a controlled explosion, it, it takes a lot longer to get there, much like driving takes longer than flying, but you can get there much safer than you could with a controlled explosion. Yep, that's basically the plan. Uh, when would you be able to put humans up? I mean, how, what would it take for you to actually put near mortals in, uh, uh, get them up to say to the International Space Station? Well. Years ago, I'd try to guess and predict and where the program's going. We actually have a pretty solid plan. We actually laid out all this 32 years ago, and even all the missions that we were going to fly. And sometimes we're a little ahead on our mission schedule. Sometimes we're a little behind on the mission schedule. Right now, we're probably about a year behind where we thought we would be 32 years ago. Um, and I hate making predictions. I'll, I'll make a guess when we're going to have a manned system going, and if we have 20 successful missions but haven't achieved that yet, oh, we get so much just bad hate mail and well, things. All right, well, rather, uh, than we are guessing, starting the man well, rather than guessing the date, what, what would it take to get from where you're at today to a manned mission? So then you're not committing to a time, you're just committing to a... Um, a oh, well, we've actually got our first crew selected for the first manned mission, and they're in training. We picked up an, a small aircraft for doing to, you know, introduction to flight, get them used to that. We've uh, just finished our crew module mock-up, full size, so we can start crew training. Our very first flight will probably be middle of next year uh, with a man crew, and it's just going to be this very exciting and stunning single stage to five feet. <laughs> um, awesome. And, well, you know, we'll I think I can do that without a that. balloon. <laughs> Yeah, that's the odd thing. You could probably almost jump to that height, and yet we're probably going to use $100,000 worth of gear to do it. Because <laughs> um, we were actually the slowest space program in history. We take little baby steps, little baby steps. And then this is one of the station vehicles. And then we'll start doing the high flights of the station later in the year, stair-stepping. And then probably by the beginning of the following year, have the vehicle just over 120,000 feet. Um, of course, that's nowhere near getting into space or orbit, but that's really our first anchor uh, to the manned flights. It seems like this could really change space flight. I mean, we've got the Virgin Galactics of the world that are going to charge $200,000 per ticket, um, but, you know, there are a lot of safety concerns there and a lot of reasons that those tickets are so expensive. Wouldn't this be able to drive the price of consumer-based um, flights to at least suborbital down, or is it just going to be just as expensive due to whatever? You know, no matter how we turn the numbers, if, we, if this is actually possible, if we overcome the hurdles, the reoccurring costs of the vehicle are lower than the operating costs of a 747. So oh, it's oh, going to be on wow. that type of order of magnitude of costs. Wow. Well, that, I mean, this just seems like amazing ground chain, just breaking technology. Uh, you know, why are we not hearing more of this out in the world? Or is it just that it's, oh. it's too bleeding edge still? Because um, it's, it's the craziest idea possible. You can't, simply can't do this. <laughs> uh, the, so the only thing to do, the only way to show people or to convince people, because we don't try to convince people. We don't want to make people believers or that kind of thing. We're just showing what we do. And every mission, every year, we're higher, we're faster, we're farther. Um, and we're going to show them by actually doing it. Nice. 
or it'll all crash and burn and we won't do it. And people can say, well, I told you so. But either way, you know, it's a good ride. You know, uh, Space Cadet uh, had a really good question, and I was thinking this myself. How many people can you take to orbit uh, in a single trip? Um, in a single trip, just from the weights, depending on whether you go for, um, you know, you're carrying cargo or you're carrying um, passengers. If you actually did a pure passenger vehicle, yeah. um, you could talk. You could literally carry 80, 90 people in a shot. <laughs> uh, very, I mean, because you're talking extreme uh, heavy load lifters. This thing only works on the large scale. Our initial orbital insertion vehicle, or excuse me, our initial uh, space vehicle, we're doing one similar to, to BERT's where it's just an up and down, non-orbital space. That we call that our trans-atmospheric sender. And that's a two-person vehicle. And the modeling that has come together I'm hoping to find the first mock version. Mm. I say the mock version has a small and just shot that 100,000 feet to get the dynamic working. You know, so that's a long way from there to space, and there's still a lot of things to overcome. But if we pull it off, it changes everything. So we think it's to take a shot at. You know, I, I, I completely agree. This could potentially change everything. You're talking about 80 people to space, where right now the most people we can bring to space on a vehicle that's about to be retired is seven. I'm sorry, I take that back. It's eight. Most people we could bring to space is eight. We've already coined the term space bus loon. Sp space bus loon? <laughs> Go order order the dot com of that. That's what we've decided. This, you know, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, I oh, I, I, I. This is fascinating. All right, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I want to touch on a few of your other projects really quick because this is real tech. This isn't science fiction. This is stuff that you actually can do and you have done. I want to talk about oh. really quickly before we go into our post show. I'd like to talk about your ping pong balls into space, and then we're going to continue this conversation in post-show, and I'm going to make people buy Epic so they can get the post-show, because this is amazing stuff. The Pong set? Yeah, the Pong set. T talk to me about that really quick. Oh, when we started, actually only half of what we do is the Airship to Orbit program. Mm -hmm. We decided we wanted a space program that everybody could be a part of, and that's why we're, we're literally an all-volunteer organization. I'm just a small paid staff trying to keep it all together, but the thing is not to wait till the end, not till you have the spaceship at the end and then get everyone to participate. We want to do it right at the beginning. So we literally fly little thousands of student payloads and we're up to a little over, a, excuse me, 10,000 students through the program uh, so far. And we're flying another 170 in just nine days on our next, we're actually doing a pretty ambitious five mission set in about nine days. Hmm. Two runs to 120,000 feet, two runs to 100,000 feet and one low-altitude test vehicle, just a 20,000, hmm. all, all in nine days from now, so it's kind of crazy. But before a mission, ping-pong balls start showing up on my desk by the hundreds. <laughs> and what kids do is they cut a ping-pong ball in half, mm -hmm. and they put their experiment inside, mm -hmm. put a piece of tape around it, and send it to us. We load it on the vehicle, we haul it up to wherever we're going, and send it back after to the to the student, or we actually anyone flies it. We've got university professors, we have students, we have Cub Scouts, everybody you can imagine flies with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people say, what can you put in a ping pong ball? It's just too small. They're just amazing, the experiments they do. I had a whole set of first graders, and they flew gummy bears. There was a gummy bear in oh. each pong set. I think, what kind of, it's not science. Well, it was a local one, so I took them all back, and one of the little kids in the back said, why is my gummy bear rough? And so we start talking about outgassing of materials. And I actually had an intelligent discussion for a half hour about outgassing in space with six-year-olds. Oh, so huh. kindergartners. And oh they gosh. had a better intuitive understanding of outgassing than engineers that I know. I mean, they understand the phenomenon, but they don't have that gut knowledge and that intuitiveness right. of it that all these six-year-olds had from flying their gummy bears oh. in pot sets. And then... About half of them now are getting very, very sophisticated. Um, some of them have dual computers on board. The most had 17 sensors. And it, had, it was measuring pressure, light, vibration, acceleration, all kinds of things. And then downloading it all to a data logger on board. And about half of them are coming with computers now, uh, doing all kinds of really amazing things. And, but my favorite are always still the simple ones. You put the mini marshmallow inside, it puffs up in the vacuum, freeze dries, and that's a great experiment. 
um, to get kids actually involved, not just watching the next video, but actually running their own program. And we don't charge anything for it. You know, the people who show up to, to do the program, all they have to do is email me and tell me how many they want. Because they have to put an ID number on each one. Right. Because all of a sudden we have 600 ping pong balls. They all start to look alike. Right. <laughs> it's, hmm. Everyone's got to put, you know, I give them their ID numbers. And all they do is the teacher or the student, you know, writes a, the, the number on their ping pong ball and mails it to us. And they're, they're in the program. That's really cool. I want... You know, it's not a ping pong ball, but I want to fly my iPad up for absolutely no scientific it's experiment. It's not going to fit in a ping pong ball. You know, I, I mean, I Even have to crush it. Even if you blend it, it. I just it's want, not I just fit. want to fly it up so I can have something. I want to have like an iPad that went to space and then sell it on eBay. How, how much does that weigh? Uh, uh, you know, not it's you know, it's heavier than you would expect. I think it's like one and a half pounds or something like that. Something like that. It's, yeah. it's pretty heavy, actually. You know, just for the sheer marketing of it, because we're always marketing, doing things, flying chairs, stuff. You know, we fly coffee for a coffee shop opening in Seattle um, for promoting. Send me your iPod before the ninth, and I'll fly it. And then you just scream on your next show, my iPod flew in space. I, you know, we should absolutely do that. Absolutely. All right, uh, stay with us. We're going to join you back in post-show. I do want to give away a winner to this book, so give me a second. Um, stall for me while I bring up the random website. Oh, okay. I'm stalling. Um, I, oh. Go ahead. Oh, I could show the chair. We just did a flight for Toshiba. Oh, that's right. Speaking of flying strange things, you can see this. I love it. Where we flew a chair. Actually, we flew four chairs over two days to 100,000 feet and filmed a commercial that appeared in Europe and Japan, and it was just a huge success for them and just a lot of fun. That's if you go to Space Chair on YouTube, you can see the commercial because it wasn't a U.S. commercial at all, so you have right. to go to YouTube to see it. There you go. Yeah, and I, I forgot to download that prior to the show. All right, uh, stay with us. We're going to come back to you in the Epic Post Show. And for anyone who wants to watch the rest of this interview, uh, sign up to Space Cast Epic so that you can see this because uh, we're going to have a very casual uh, conversation, and it's going to, I guarantee you it's going to be awesome. So, John, stay with us. And the winner of John's uh, book, Floating to Space, is none other than Space Cast's own Quantum G. So congratulations, Quantum, for the tweet. Uh, it was actually a retweet, one of the most creative minds in the industry, John Powell, on Space Week Cast. So congratulations, Quantum. We'll send this out to you uh, shortly. Uh, and for everyone else watching us, uh, thank you very much for watching us live or on demand. Again, sign up to Space Week Cast Epic. It's what helps make the, makes these shows possible. They start as low as $8.33 per year if you sign up for a yearly subscription or ten dollars per month you can also continue to watch this interview in post show you also get other great things like the raw mpeg2 feed of today's obama speech or the raw mpeg2 feed from the um, space shuttle launch this is the only place i know of on the internet that you can get that stuff it also and by the way uh... we finally got it going and thank you very much to pete in the chat room for pretty much single-handedly making this happen but space vidcast epic is now available completely ad free Live shows, HD shows, on-demand shows, if you watch it in Space Vidcast and you're signed into Epic, no advertisements, no pre-rolls, no pop-up ads, just straight, pure, awesome Space Vidcast injected directly into the vein. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Uh-oh. What? Who is it? Oh, it's Jeffrey Manber, oh, the of author course. of Selling Peace. Yep, absolutely. So, actually, I think he's been in the chat room before. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, great. Um, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>